when we used to work on the uh, bus ministry in Oklahoma City, we had this little uh, system that we tried for a while. Not saying it was super successful, but we would give the kids, and by the way, if you've never worked in bus ministry, this is usually how it goes. Candy, 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 you know, <laughs> whatever, bubble gum, I mean, whatever you can get to get them to come, they'll come and you load them up with sugar, then you send them home to their parents and you let them. <laughs> and so one of the things we would do is some of our bus workers would get these uh, like starbursts or something like that, all kinds of different types of candy, sour punch candies, they like those. And they'd get these starbursts and uh, we, we decided to try something. I mean, if we could, we would just spank kids whenever they were bad, but we can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but some of those kids were bad. I mean, we were in some bad neighborhoods. In fact, I wrote this song one time about the bus ministry. And, uh, and in the song, it talks about how one of the kids almost bit off my two-year-old's finger. That's a true story. We we're just sitting there, and my son is looking around, and he had his finger there. And next thing you know, my son starts screaming, and we're like, what's wrong? And he's like this. And we look, and he's got teeth marks on this. But anyway, it was, it was, it was a chore to make these kids behave. So I tried this system and I was like, I got an idea. Okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to say, if you will behave, every one of you, when you get off, you know, all we got to do is get from the church and to take you home. It was like a half hour drive. But we were like, by the time we get there, uh, you know, you, we will give you a reward if you behave. So everybody, as of right now, on the bus gets a reward. The reward is you get five starbursts. Okay, five starbursts. We've got them for you already designated when you get off. However, if on the trip you begin to misbehave and we got to write your name down. Remember when the teacher used to write your name on the board and then she'd like write check marks next to it or whatever. <laughs> if you misbehave, we'll write your name down and that means you lose a starburst. If we put a check next to it, you lose another starburst. If we lose a, uh, another check next to it, you lose another one until all of a sudden you've lost your reward. And, uh, and so I thought about uh, offering an, uh, today, and I was like, let's see. I can pick on one of these kids. I can be like, okay, Reuben, no starburst, okay? Uh, those are bad for you. They rot your teeth and all that, but I'll be like, okay, so here's the deal, man. If you're good, you're always, you're always good during the service. But I say, if you're good, you got a dollar right here, all right? Four quarters. But if you start screaming, I'm going to take one of your quarters away. You hit your brother, Sebastian, let me know if he hits you. We'll take one away, <laughs> right? You start, like, falling asleep while I'm preaching, take one away. That goes for all of you. No, just kidding. <laughs> and, uh, you understand how that system works, right? It's like, I'm going to give you a reward. And what's a reward, by the way? Not a gift, right? A reward is something that's based on your behavior. A gift would be, hey, I'm just going to give it to you. It's not based on your reward. That's important, okay, to, to understand that. But I'm going to reward you, but I'm going to, but that is that reward has conditions. I'm going to watch you, and if you don't behave, I'm going to take away at least part of that reward. Okay, so you understand how that principle goes, and all throughout the Bible we see uh, that principle. And so, the title of the message this morning is receiving a full reward. Of course, that comes from verse eight. It says, "Look to yourselves." that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. And so uh, it's kind of interesting there. He's talking from him. He's including himself in that. He's saying, you look to yourselves that we <laughs> might not lose those things which we, we, which we have wrought. That's kind of interesting uh, uh, perspective in there. But anyway, from verse 8 right there is where we get this, uh, that's where I get the idea of the message as a whole. I'm trying to do this kind of somewhat expository going through John. It's been a little difficult. That's not my strong suit, and it ends up being more like a little study and uh, sometimes gets boring. But I'm going to try to uh, try to show you this. Basically, the idea is that we need to focus on not so much how well we start our race, but how we finish the race. You've heard that before, and that makes sense, okay? You come into this, uh, this race, and you're like, that's it, man. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do really good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get this. Let's say you sign up for the Potluck 100. I'm going <laughs> to finish strong, man. And then the first two miles, you're giving it everything you got. Uh, 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 and they're like, wow, man, look how fast he's going. Yeah, but 
how well are you going to finish at that point, right? So you can say, oh, look, at, look how well I did. I, I'm running the race strong. No, no, no. We want to know what's going to happen at the end of the race. Ecclesiastes uh, says this, Ecclesiastes 7, 1, Solomon said, A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of one's birth. If you think about it, the day somebody's born, that's we celebrate, it's an amazing thing, new life into this earth, but we really don't know anything about that life, what it's going to do. The Bible talks about children being like arrows in the hands of a mighty man, blessed is he whose quiver is full, and you think, well, I really don't know for sure yet what these kids are going to do, how they're going to be used, right? But, uh, but the idea is that we would, uh, you know, they would live a good life, and at the end of their life, you know, people would have great things to say about it. We just had a funeral not that long ago, Miss Mary Lee. And man, it was just a great uh, service in that it celebrated her life. Everybody had wonderful things to say about her, uh, how good of a Christian she was, how good of a, of a mother and a grandmother she was, and all these things that she did. And I, as her pastor, was able to say for sure she was very supportive of her pastor and her church, and she was an encourager. She was always there to help out and everything. And I thought, that's what finishing your life well looks like. doesn't matter how you started it. It matters how you, how you finish it. This phrase is also used in Ruth chapter 2, the only other place in the Bible it's used. Let's go to Ruth chapter 2. All right, man, got four quarters right there. How's Reuben doing? Still good so far. All right, Ruth chapter 2. In chapter 11, And Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath been fully showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother, all that has been done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother in the land of thy nativity, and art come unto a people which thou knowest not heretofore. And so she had sacrificed a lot for the Lord, really. Remember she said, your people be my people and your God my God. And that her decision on this was following, the, was following the Lord. So here's what he says in verse 12. The Lord recompense thy work and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel under whose wings thou art come to trust. And so she entered into the, the faith and she entered into, you know, serving the Lord. And Boaz said, you know, let the Lord give you a full reward. And so that's what we're talking about. Some people in life, some Christians, it's like they realize that this life is just a vapor. And they realize that when I die, that's just the beginning of eternity, right? When I die, it's not like, okay, I'm gone, you know, so... While you're here, get the biggest toys you can, have the most fun, <laughs> you know, go out with a bang. No, because after this life, right, that's, that's just the beginning. And so the Bible says in Hebrews 9, 27, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. And so we have to realize and live our life as though, hey, one day there's going to be a judgment because there is. And sometimes I think people get it mixed up and they say, no, 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 but we're not, we're not saved by works. Our works don't matter. Well, that's true, but there's still going to be a judgment. Now, there is a different judgment for believers than there, are, than there is for unbelievers. Okay, The Bible makes that clear, and it talks about that in Revelation 20 and other places. And Revelation 20 calls it the first resurrection and the second resurrection. And at that first resurrection, there is a judgment. When Christ comes back, He gives His reward you know, before the set up, setting up of the millennium. And so believers who are resurrected with Christ, uh, whether in the rapture or, or you know, uh, rising up from the grave, whatever, they uh, receive their reward. There's some kind of a, a, a judgment there called the judgment seat of Christ. After the millennium, there's another judgment called the great white throne judgment. And the Bible makes it clear these are two separate things. Okay, but don't be mis don't don't make the mistake of thinking that we're not going to be judged. We're going to be judged. Our judgment is just going to look a lot different because of the fact that we already got our gift of salvation. We accepted the free gift of salvation. Now what he's interested in is the reward. Okay? 
when it comes to the other judgment, they're saying, hey, reward me with eternal life because my works. And he's going to say, I never knew you. Right. So that's total different judgment than the judgment that we are going to be part of. But there is a judgment. And some people have, have lived their life realizing that, you know, yes, I'm saved. Yes, I'm going to heaven. I've got eternal life. But I don't want to finish my life and just barely get in as it were. You know what I mean? Just get in empty handed and not have anything to show and to be a disappointment and, uh, and to be judged and, and, and have things taken away and all that. And so that's what the message is about in a nutshell. Verse 8 being the main, the main verse we want to look at. So number one we see here in 2 John, we see that he's writing to the elect lady. And there are basically two main schools of thought as to who is the elect lady talking about. And I, I'm not, uh, I'll just give you both views because I don't really, it's not that big of a deal to me which one you believe. But who is the elect lady? One view is this, that it could be talking about, uh, referring to a specific church. And he's just calling the church uh, the lady, right? The elect lady. And, and if you think about it, that kind of, makes sense. I mean, there's often times where, you know, something is giving a given a gender. In fact, uh, you know, when the, the New Jerusalem com, comes down, right, it's, it's described as a bride adorning herself, right? And so, uh, so even New Jerusalem is, is, is referred to as that. The song we sing, Rise Up, O Men of God, it says, The church for you doth wait. Her strength unequal to the task, rise up and make her great. See, I was talking about the church as a her. You know, we do that. We talk about uh, America sometimes as she. And, uh, and so I suppose that could be a poetic way of saying it. Some have even insinuated that it could have been a uh, kind of a secret way of saying it. I, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, but like it was kind of a secret code or something like that. So, but others believe that this is actually talking about a specific lady who kind of had a church in her house. Now, don't let that trip you up because we see that actually a lot of times in the Bible. Look at Acts chapter 12. It doesn't mean that she was the pastor of the church. We know that that's not supposed to be the case. But Acts chapter 12 and verse 12. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. So here are some of the early saints there uh, in the early church were gathered together at Mary's house. Okay, look at chapter 16. There are other places as well we could go to, but I'll just mention these two. Chapter 16, verse 40. And they went out of the prison and entered into the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brother and they comforted them and departed. And so, uh, you know, the brethren again were there in the house of Lydia. Uh, there, like I said, there are some other places that, that we could go to. But basically, look, a lot of different people had land. They had houses, right? But, it's, but it was also common for people not to have houses and to live with other people, you know, to be part of their family. And so oftentimes, let's say somebody's husband passed away and they and they basically everything they owned went to the wife, you know, she would still have that. Uh, I've heard stories of churches being planted where there was nothing but just a handful of ladies, you know, who were single ladies, widows or something like that. And, and they just had this desire for a church to start. And so they started meeting together and having people come and eventually they got a, a guy in there and, and, and a, a church sent a pastor to start it or, or however uh, it works out. But look, that could happen. And so perhaps he's talking about this church and this lady is an influential person in the church. I don't really know, but whichever the case, here's what I want you to notice. Go back to the text there. The main thing to notice is that it says the elder, okay, that's talking about himself, the elder unto the elect lady. All right. So once again, I have talked about this in every chapter so far that we looked at in 1 John. And then now in 2 John, we see it again. John is talking to believers. He's talking to believers. Every time the word elect is used, 
it's talking about believers, all right? Now, interesting, believe is a verb, but it's an action. We have to we have to choose to do it, <laughs> all right? Believing is something that we choose to do. Yet people will say that the elect are people that God just chose, and He gave them faith, and they didn't, they didn't have a choice, really. God just, just chose them, chose some people to go to heaven, chose some people to go to hell. Don't believe that at all. And now the word elect and uh, predestination and all that might trip some people up, but when you read it in the context of the Bible, here's what you see. Those people who choose to put their trust in the Lord hey, they're predestined to be uh, Christ-like. They're predestined to be followers of Christ, okay? Those who put their trust in the Lord, those are part of the elect that God's, you know, talked about since the beginning of time. They're part of that group of people who are called the elect. So every time the Bible says elect, it's just talking about saved people in general. And so here, John, we find out the first point is this. John is writing to believers. We understand that. And not only does he talk about the elect lady, but keep reading, it says the elder unto the elect lady and her children. All right, so whoever this lady is, or maybe they're symbolic or whatever, but the people in this church are a group of believers. They're saved people, okay, which is what a church is supposed to be, by the way. You know, happy if somebody walks in here and they're not saved, we can give them the gospel. That's great. But church isn't supposed to be a place where we just draw a big crowd of unbelievers and then preach them the gospel. We go into the world and preach the gospel, and then when they come to church, we have a group of believers who are growing and strengthening each other and encouraging each other to do the work, okay? So he's talking to a church here, a congregation of believers. Look at verse 4. I rejoiced greatly that I found, found of thy children walking in truth as we have received a commandment from the Father. Look at verse 13. The children of thy elect sister greet thee. Amen. Now, if you back up to, uh, uh, let me see here, chapter 5 uh, of First John, chapter 5, verse 4. Now, where did I get distracted here? Oh, no, I'm sorry. Go to Third John. I went the wrong direction. Third John chapter one. Third John chapter one. He says this in in that verse I just read. He's he's saying, you know, I was glad to find that your children, thy child, thy children walketh in truth. In chapter three, he says this in verse four. He says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Okay, and so the children there are probably, you know, just referencing people who are believers, young believers who have been one to the Lord, and they are beginning to walk in truth. And how great that is for this elder, John, okay? He's called himself an elder. Elder's the name of a pastor, right? But he seemed to have a little bit of a, of a higher place of authority, maybe as an apostle. And so, but he calls himself the elder, and he's just saying, hey, I have no greater joy than to see my children walk in truth. And look, I know that's true for my physical children, my blood children. If I see them walking in truth, you know, I come out, see them reading their Bible, come out, see them, you know, talking about the Lord, doing good things. Boy, that's going to bring me great joy. Yeah, I'm going to be more excited about that than just about anything else, right? And so, uh, but not only that, when I find out that as a pastor, that the church that I'm overseeing is walking with the Lord, you know, helping each other out. You know, after the service, I look over and I see guys with their Bibles out and they're talking to each other and iron sharpening iron, not that kind of a thing. Man, that's exciting as a pastor to see. You know, or, or whenever I'm, you know, in Iola and like I said, that uh, young guy I've been working with and he comes to me and he just starts talking about things that he's given up in his life and things that he wants to do for the Lord or or somebody that he led to the Lord at work, and I'm just like, man, I'm just overwhelmed with joy. And I didn't do anything to, you know, that, that's not like my reward necessarily, but I get great joy and I kind of feel like I'm part of that. <laughs> I feel like I'm getting a reward for some of that, you know, uh, secondhand there, okay? So, uh, so here he's talking to believers. There's no doubt about that. Whoever the elect lady is, her children, we know we're talking about born-again believers, okay? So, the second part is this, John emphasizes again, 
a lot of repetition, okay? There's a lot of repetition as we go through this. Anytime you do expository preaching, you're going to come across that. But, uh, you know, it's all right. There's a, everything we do in life is going to require a lot of repetition. You know, you go to work, same thing, every day, every day. Go work out, you got to keep lifting the weights the same way. Go running, you know, you got to wake up a certain time, you got to do that. Everything in life is repetition. So don't ever get discouraged. Come to church, sounds like I'm hearing the same things, the same things. Well, I'll try to find a different way to say it. I'll try to make it more exciting, but guess what? The Bible tells us what to do, and that doesn't change. <laughs> so we keep on pointing you back to what the Bible says. And here's what John's point is. Again, now you read it whenever he writes uh, the, the Gospel of John a whole lot. You see it when he, in, in 1 John. You see it in 2 John. We see it in 3 John. He is admonishing everybody to love one another. So John's emphasis is loving one another. And let's read verse 5 and 6. If you remember anything about the message last week, this was the main point, that loving one another is, cannot be separated from uh, walking after His commandments. Look at verse 5 and 6. And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we have from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk after His commandments. This is the commandment that, as ye have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. Now let's pause there for a minute. Go to the Gospel of John, John chapter 13. You see, John was really super close with the Lord. And I realize this is all inspired from, uh, by God anyway, but we can see through John's writings a lot of insight into some of the things that Jesus taught. You remember John was the one that laid on Jesus' breast at the Lord's Supper, and he's the one who calls himself the disciple that Jesus loved. Look at John chapter 13, verse 34. These were the words of Jesus. He said, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also may uh, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. This morning in Iola, I preached on uh, the title of the message was Whose Shoes Should You Shine? I don't know if you heard about Dan Cathy. Is Dan Cathy? The uh, CEO of Chick-fil-A. And he came out with this uh, in this talk that was televised where he was saying, you know, that the, the conversation was about the Black Lives Matter ordeal and the protesting and, and, and racial uh, differences and stuff. And so he actually got down and there's this black rapper named Lecrae. I don't know if you've ever heard. I've heard the name, but I don't know anything about him. And he was there on the panel as well as they were talking this out. And at the end of the conversation, he gets down with this shoe polish and brush and says, you know, hey, what we need to do, you know, in reference to white, white, Christ, white people, but maybe more importantly, Christians, you know, I think maybe his motive was to point to Christ washing the disciples' feet and whatever. But he says, what we need to do is be willing to get down. And he gets down. And he begins to shine Lecrae's shoes, which he had tennis shoes on, so that, didn't, that kind of messed up his illustration. But he shined, <laughs> he shined his tennis shoes, and, uh, and he was making this point. And so the title of the message was, Whose Shoes Should We Shine? And the thing that the Bible says, now I, I'm not saying it's wrong to shine somebody's shoes, but the thing that the Bible actually says in, in, in terms of, of uh, loving one another, Jesus said to the disciples, he said, you know, as you have seen me do, do ye to one another, okay? And all the commandments in the Bible as far as loving one another and being there to care for one another, uh, you know, what we're really talking about is believers, all right? Now, I hope that one day this place is filled up and we have all different colors of skin in this assembly. You know, it's certainly, certainly not my intention uh, to ever the, you know, to, to prefer one race over another. Everybody in here I know feels the same way. Uh, racism really has no, no, place, no place here, right? But, you know, when it comes to, well, who should we bow down to? Who should we cater to? Who should we lift up, right? It's not just like, oh, well, we owe this group of people something or this group of people are demanding that we respect them or whatever. And there's nothing in the Bible that says, oh, so you just need to get down and, and respect them. for." No, no, no. Here's what we do. We love the brethren. We take care of one another. 
Now, we love the world, too, just like God loved the world, and He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, right? We go into the world and give the gospel. That's because we love the world. But we don't hang out with them, be part of them, do the things that they do. The Bible says, not love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, right? And in fact, He calls you an adulterer, an adulteress, if you uh, begin to be part of the world's philosophies and the world's ways. Hey, you're, you're going the wrong way. We're supposed to be separated unto God. So as being separated unto God, we need each other, brothers and sisters in Christ, to lift each other up. And so therefore, we love one another. And so anyway, that's kind of what the service was about this morning. And it was saying that we love one another. But we love one another. What's more important, if we provided service, because that's what that's actually a symbolic for, just serving one another, right? The Bible talks about serving one another. And so even if we never, if we failed at ever serving one another, it should be our desire, right, to serve the Lord. If the Lord was physically here, if Jesus was physically here, it would be our desire. I hope everybody in here would say, man, I want to be there right at the feet of Jesus. You know, if he needs something, I'm going to go get it. You know, if his, if his collar's out of place, man, I'm going to be the first one to fix it. If he's got some lint there, I'm going to get it off. I'm going to, I'm going to polish his shoes, you know, because he's my Lord and he's my Savior. And, and, uh, and, I, and, and we want to do everything. Well, guess what? Jesus isn't physically here in bodily form, all right? But here's what he says. Whatever you've done unto the least of these, my disciples, you've done unto me, okay? So we actually love the Lord and serve the Lord by serving and loving one another, all right? That's what he wants us to do. He lived and he died for the church, and we're supposed to love the church and to uh, take care of one another. So, uh, so John emphasizes loving one another, but he says he ties that in just like we did in first, first. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, first John five. He ties that in with keeping the commandments. Let's look at that again. First John five one through three. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God, look, and keep His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not grievous. So there's a direct link there. There's a tie-in of loving people, the proper kind of love that we can only have through God, who is love, right? And God teaches us how to love one another. So if we say, oh, I love them so much. I mean, I, yeah, I love the Lord too, but... I'm going to love them, and, and, and in loving them, I'm going to have to disobey God. Look, that happens all the time. That happens all the time. Family comes in, and someone says, Hey, I, you know, I know I should be in church, but my family you know, has got this, this thing going on. And there are some times when people will say, you know, I know I'm supposed to love the Lord, and I'm supposed to you know, follow Him and forsake not the assembling of myself together, but I love my family, so i got to go do this. Well, what you're essentially saying is that it's okay to disobey God to show my love for my family. And the Bible says that's not love, right? I used the example last week about spanking. Someone says, well, I love my, I know the Bible talks about spanking, but, you know, I just love my kids so much, I just can't bring myself to do it. Well, according to the Bible, you don't. In fact, the Bible says that if you don't chasten your children, you hate them. And so uh, that doesn't mean you, that just totally defines you, but in that moment and in that action, you are not loving them. Loving them uh, requires that we obey the commandments of God. So interestingly, he's also consistent in this. He also contrasts that the love of God and the love for, for others, our brothers and sisters, with, with not being deceived by people who preach false gospels. Look at uh, verse 7 back in our, our uh, second John. Verse 7 says, now look, he just got done saying, And this is love, that you walk after his commandments. This is a commandment that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. For many deceivers are entered into the world, who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves, that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. So here's what he's saying. Here's how you're going to receive your reward. You're going to have to love the brethren. And if you love the brethren, you're going to have to keep them from false doctrine. You're going to have to watch out for people that would creep in unawares. You're going to have to make sure that you fight against false teaching and all that kind of stuff. Why? Because you love the brethren. 
This is exactly the opposite of what a lot of the mega churches do. They're like, well, I love everybody, so we're not going to talk about doctrine. <laughs> who was who was given a, an example of a? They were at church and the and the guy. Oh, I think it was Brother Justin said that that pastor was getting ready to say something about the homosexuals, and he was just like, no, nah, I'm not even going to go there. Well, look, what he probably did right there was grieve the Holy Spirit, and he probably demonstrated that he loved himself more than he loved the church because he wanted to refrain from saying something because he didn't want what might happen if he offends somebody. And so really that shows that he loved himself more than he loved the church. Uh, so uh, any kind of any pastor has to be careful not to do that, or any preacher. Okay, so he's consistent here because he did the same thing in 1 John 5. Look at uh, 1 John 5, 4. Again, he just got done saying, for who's... Uh, 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 for this is love of God, that you keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he that came by what? And he goes in and he, and he talks about this. He starts talking about false doctrine. Okay, so it's very consistent right there. In fact, go down to verse 9. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God, I'm in First uh, John 5. The witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath this witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave his Son. So he's consistent, bringing these uh, two concepts together, loving one another and uh a walking in truth and, and fighting against false doctrine, okay? So something I didn't bring out last week as well, look back again to 1 John 5. These are so closely related that I can just kind of go back and add a few things. I don't think I brought this up at all, but last week, uh, for the sake of time, I kind of skipped over this section. In chapter 5, look at verse 14. Here's another thing to add in there. If we love our brethren... This is going to include, again, this is, has to do with staying in the commandment, walking in the commandments of, of God, but uh, this is also going to include helping them to do right and helping them to receive the forgiveness of their sins whenever they fall, you know, when they're overcome with a fault or whatever. Here's what it says, 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. And this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. And if we know that He heareth us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of Him. If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that ye shall pray for it. All righteousness, all unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. And so what he's saying is like, there, there comes a point when somebody has reached a line where, you know, God is going to deal with them. You know, I think of it like this. God actually in the Old Testament, there were certain uh, sins that the punishment of that sin was death. Right. So therefore, if my brother or sister in Christ commits one of those sins and he ends up in jail and he's got the death penalty, I shouldn't be praying Lord, get him out of there. He doesn't deserve that. <laughs> He's a good believer. No, he committed murder or he, you know, whatever. You know, there, there's, there's, uh, there's only a few things that are specifically uh, named as sins worthy of death. And, uh, and so anyway, the, uh, where was I going with that? Okay, oh yeah, so, so if we see our brother or sister, let's say they're getting into fornication. Or let's see, uh, let's say they're married, and we see like they're kind of flirting around with people, or talking about you know uh, being alone with somebody the opposite sex or whatever. And we need to say, hey, I don't want this person, you know, to be uh, to fall into adultery or something like that. Maybe they're looking at things they shouldn't look at, or they're dealing. Look, we all have friends. Let's look at the world that we live in right now. We all have friends, or maybe even ourselves, are occasionally uh, tempted and getting in the flesh when it comes to fornication, pornography, anything like that. So, look, if we know our brother or sister are falling into that, it should hurt us so bad, and we should want so bad because we love them to get them out of that that we'll do whatever it takes to to get them out of that and to pray for them. We ought to be praying for one another. Uh, you know, and so I, I respect, I, I love it whenever I get calls from people saying, hey, pray for now. Look, I'm not the Pope. 
I'm not the Father. You don't have to call me and confess your sins to me. <laughs> right? But if you're falling into sin and you're like, Brother Rocky, I, I need you to pray for me. Would you pray for me? I'm happy to do that. Like, I'm not going to, uh, uh, you know, think less of you for that. I'll think, I'll think higher of you, actually, because I know you're trying to get forgiveness, and I want to help you with that. That's something that the Bible says that we should do for one another. Okay? And then finally, John warns about the reality of losing our reward. That's where we started in verse 8. Let's read it once again. He says, look, not, uh, look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Real quickly now, let me go through these verses. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. What do you mean, losing a reward? Well, if we don't do these things, if we're not loving one another, if we're not walking in the commandments, uh, then we are likely to lose our reward. Here's something that Jesus said about uh, not necessarily losing reward. It's, it's kind of like they never actually had the reward, but you can see uh, you can see here. Let's just read it, and then I'll tell you. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. Take heed that ye do not your alms before men to be seen of them, otherwise ye have no reward uh, of your Father which is in heaven. So you could look at that and say, like, well, there's really nothing to reward because from the very beginning they were, one, they were only given the alms to be seen of men. And so there really wasn't a reward to begin with. But I also look at it like this. If I am doing right in giving alms, helping somebody out, wanting to be a blessing, you know, somebody's really struggling, I'm wanting to be a blessing, and then after I help them, I just start kind of patting myself on the back, and before long, I'm like, man, I kind of need, I kind of want somebody to know that I did that. And so I try to finagle away <laughs> to let everybody know about how I helped them. I just kind of accidentally let it slip, right, because I want people to, to recognize me. Well, Jesus said, well, you don't get a reward for that. You got your reward. Your reward was, wow, he's such a good guy. He helped this person out. That's not a reward that's laid up in heaven. Those kinds of things are secret type things. Those are things that we do only for the Lord, not for our own reward and gratification here on, on earth. So Jesus talks about that. And, you know, if you go on, he talks about alms. He talks about fasting. He talks about prayer. Any of those types of things, if you do it to be seen of men, uh, then you don't receive a reward for that. Paul talks about losing, his, uh, losing rewards. Look at for, uh, 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5, great verse. For we know, again, writing to believers, okay, this is important that we understand this. We're talking to Christians now. The type of judgment that Christians are going to receive has to do with what was laid on the foundation, which is Jesus Christ. What, did, what was built upon that foundation? For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. Amen. Can't wait to shed this body and get a glorified body. I'm just thinking my glorified body can run 100 miles, no problem. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon our house, uh, which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality may be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in this body according to that He hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are uh, I trust also are manifest in your conscience. So flip back to First Corinthians chapter three now. But he says right there, he says, "We'll all appear before the judgment seat of Christ." 
to give uh, a, a, an account and to receive the things uh, according to our works, whether they're good or bad. Okay, First Corinthians chapter three. First Corinthians three, start with verse five. Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted. Now, 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 by the way, that's something he gave, right? That was a gift. That wasn't a reward. He's given to every man a, 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 an ability, something you can do, a part in the ministry, all right? You know, you got something that he's given to you, all right? That's not your gift. I mean, that's not your reward. That's just something he gave you. And he said this, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything Neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereupon, thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, two different types of substances, gold, silver, precious stones, and then wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So, man, that verse, you've got to know where that verse is. So when somebody starts coming at you with the fact that you thinking that you can lose your salvation, you got to take them here and understand, look, you, can re, you cannot lose your salvation. You can lose your testimony. You can lose your rewards. There's a lot of things that you can lose, but you can't lose your salvation right? once you're a believer. Okay, so this is a different judgment, but this is a judgment where we want our rewards. We don't want to uh, to have loss and suffer loss whenever we get uh, when we get our reward. All right. So the conclusion is simple. We should strive to receive a full reward. Live our life realizing that the day is coming where we're going to give an account. Uh, of, of what we have. And so just like the, uh, the stewards, you know, we want to be the wise steward that when, he, when the master comes back, we've got a lot to show for because we've done things for him on this life. Not because we're expecting that's going to get us into heaven. We know better than that. We're saved through Jesus Christ alone, but we want to receive reward and we don't want to lose those rewards. Now, I know a lot of good preachers, uh, people that have been in different types of ministries and done different things from the Lord for the Lord early on in their life. And I thought, wow, that is an amazing guy. These were the guys, uh, not all of them, but some of the guys I'm thinking of, these were the ones that were kind of like, you know, the cream of the crop in Bible college. Man, that guy can preach. Man, that guy, have you seen him? And they're just like, man, he's doing all these great things. He's winning souls. He's doing, you know, he's giving up all these things. I mean, look how he dresses. Look at those shoes, how shine and polished they are. This man is going to do great things for the Lord, right? And it's not only but a few years down the road you see that just went out. <laughs> you know, that just blew up. That was just like a firecracker, right? And now he's gone, right? What we want to do is get to heaven. He, he might stand, you know, he might live the rest of his life, you know, being kind of a, a bad testimony and bringing shame and reproach to the name of Christ, stand before God. He's not going to go back and say, well, you remember when I was in Bible college? You know, all the things I did for you back then? Dude, you done lost those rewards, <laughs> all right? So it's not so important what you've done. Don't rely on, hey, don't you remember when I did this? Don't you remember how great I was? At no, no, no. You got to be consistent. You got to keep it going. You know, along the way, you're going to lose some rewards, and so you got to keep on laying up those treasures in heaven, trying to get new rewards. And so uh, uh, that should be our goal. That's what we should strive to do. How are we going to do that? Well, we need to keep learning. We need to keep staying in the truth of God's word. We cannot get tired of reading God's word. We cannot, it can't get old to us. We got to, and it won't if you're in it and if you're actually putting in the time and effort, it'll, it'll just be like renewed all the time. It's the living word of God. And once you make yourself do it, you'd be so glad that you did. Okay. So we got to stay in the word daily. Uh, we got to be refreshed. And so we need to follow uh, his commandments 
and his commandments have to do with loving one another. And so those two go hand in hand. We need to keep investing in the things that matter most in this life. There's a lot of things you can do that aren't inherently evil, but they're not doing anything for the cause of Christ. We need to make our investments more about laying up treasures in heaven than what we do on this earth. Amen. Then finally, we need to keep doing the work for the right reasons. Don't do it to be seen of men. You'll lose your reward. You get a pat on the back. People will say, wow, what a great guy. You know, I love this church that it's a soul winning church and we're seeing a lot of souls get saved. But, you know, mark my word, it, 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 it wouldn't take much for us to get big heads and start thinking, well, look what we're doing for the Lord and lose it all. Lose all our rewards, you know, because rewards will then become people patting us on the back and saying, wow, look what they did. And then we just lost our reward. OK, so we got to be focused and do the work, make the investments, but do it for the right reasons, not to be seen of men. We want to make sure when we get to heaven, we got full reward, just like uh, Reuben, who got his full reward, a whole dollar for listening to Pastor Randall and not falling asleep or beating up his brother and sister. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you uh, so much for your word. Thank you for the life that you've given us. Thank you for saving us from uh, the effects of our sins, ultimately death uh, in hell. Uh, but I thank you, Lord, that you have forgiven us of our sins and you've given us eternal life. I pray that you'll help us to know how to, to walk in the new man and to, uh, uh, to in, in invest in, th in heavenly things and things that matter for the cause of Christ. I pray that you'll help us to do great things, but help us to, um, to be consistent and to look long term and to, uh, to, to not give up on the fight, not give up on the race that you've called us to. I pray you be glorified in the end and that we would all receive a full reward for the labor that we've done. Jesus, I pray. Amen.